comments about the example that I posted. So the main task that we had last time was twofold, the main tasks. First of which was to define the main sections on a page via tags. And I pointed to a number of websites, I think including LC's website. And we can say that most websites are sort of divided into uh, uh, you know, a set of sections that are very common. You can almost pick just about any site and they'll sort of fit this pattern. That there's sort of a header on the top of the page. The header meaning to identify specifically what the page is. So there should be no confusion when you look at a page, what the page is for. And that almost sounds like obvious, like too obvious to even mention, except when you run across a page where they don't do that. And you're looking at the page and it's like, who is this for? All right. This makes it absolutely clear who the page is for. It's a page for Lorain County Community College. And so that's the function of the header. Uh, we'll notice that that header is probably going to be pretty constant across all the pages. Underneath the header usually, and sometimes it can be to the side, sometimes it can be across the top, is a navigation that shows you the main sections or pages on the site and has links to them. Um, again, going across the site horizontally is a very common way to have it. Having it along the side vertically is a common way to have it. Even sometimes having it along this side is a common way to have it. Uh, it's generally the three places that you'll find navigation on a website. And it's another one of those things that it's a good idea to have consistent. All right? People will gradually like understand how your website's structured if you keep delivering all the pages in the same format. So they don't have to guess. They don't have to look around. It's just right there. You then have a series of sections, maybe, or articles that, uh, that, that are essentially uh, the content of the page. So in this case, we have um, sort of a rotating uh, image. We have a couple other prominent links here. We have um, some information here have some articles here, have some events going through here. And then finally, on the bottom of the page, we have a footer. So those are kind of the main uh, sections of a page. Header, nav, footer. And then we have, in the middle, sections, articles, and a side. Now, I don't know what tags they used, but maybe this is an aside, because it's sort of, sort of a side, sidebar topic. All right, let's look at the example we had last time. And again, for this example, I'm going to download this. Remember that we also have to extract it for us to be able to view the web pages correctly. We can view the web pages inside the zip file, but things like links and images and CSS files, when we create those, won't work exactly right. So I'm going to click Extract, Extract All. And here we go. Index. This is the header. This is our navigation. This is our footer. 
and this is our section. All right. If we look at this in Notepad, we will see header. nav, an article, which just contains, in my case, just a simple paragraph that I typed in, and then finally a footer. Now again, just sort of a warning, there's, there's several things that start with H um, that start with the word head. There's a head section, there's a header section, and then there's headings, H1 through H6. I didn't make it up. All right, so don't blame me. I'm just trying to explain it to you. The head is one of the two main sections of the page. There's a head and a body. The head contains the title, and it's going to contain other stuff later on, kind of information more about the page rather than information that's going to appear on the page. The header is one of the main sections of the page, and you can think of it sort of as a banner that goes across the top of the page. And then the headings could appear anywhere on the page, and they're headings for, for a certain topic. And again, think of it like it's an outline. All right? Now, one thing actually that I did a little bit incorrectly here is this H2 probably should be a H1 because you sort of take the headings as being in each section. So that's the top level heading within the navigation, so it probably should be an H1. Again, doesn't really make it look any different. Okay, those are the main sections of the web page. And again, in addition to article, there are sections, there are asides. Whether something's a section or an article is sort of just a, a coin flip in a way. Um, you could categorize it either way. I wouldn't lose sleep either with, with your choice. So don't, don't sit there until 3 in the morning trying to decide whether it's a section or an article. Pick one and move on. Generally speaking, I would make it an article if it was mostly text. I would make it a section if it was other stuff. So if I had a photo gallery that was just a bunch of images, I'd probably make it a section. If, it was, if I had several paragraphs with maybe one image in it, I'd probably make it an article. But again, I wouldn't lose sleep either way. An aside is when you have sort of a related article, maybe about a certain aspect of the main article. Again, like I said before, um, you know, let's say we have an article about Labor Day, which is uh, coming up this Monday, so we don't have class on this coming Monday. All right, just to verify that. If there was a, a you know, so you might have a, an article about uh, Labor Day and how people are celebrating it in the area and the history of Labor Day and all that kind of stuff. You might have an aside about the Cleveland Air Show because the Cleveland Air Show is always Labor Day weekend and is related to the main topic. If the main topic is Labor Day, the air show is related to that. So you might put that in an aside tag just to show that it's sort of a related tag to something else. Again, none of these things, you know, these things are subject to judgment. There's, you know, I'm not going to sit and argue with you probably too hard um, whether something should be a section, an article, or an, or an aside. Now, the header, the nav, the footer, those have pretty clearly defined roles and purposes. But, so you, you shouldn't mix up those. But if you make something a section, and I would have made it an article, I'm not really going to complain or, or take points off or anything like that. Okay, the other thing we talked about was links. And links, we, we looked at two varieties of links. We looked at one variety when it's a link to someone else's page on the internet. And then we looked at a link when it is one of your pages on the internet. So we have one example of each. LCCC's homepage is something I did not write. All right? 
Therefore, we use a link tag, which is an A, A for anchor. Again, I didn't make this up, so don't blame me. A for anchor, and notice there's an additional part of the tag, and that part is called an attribute. An attribute is additional information about a tag. And in the case of a link, you need it for the link to work. It's not enough to say, hey, this is a link. You have to say a link to what page, right? Because there are literally billions of pages on the internet. You need to define which page you're linking to. And if it's someone else's page on the internet, the href attribute, which says what it's linked to, is going to start with HTTP, or maybe HTTPS, colon, slash, slash, and then the domain, or the name of the website, and then maybe some additional stuff after that, depending on the specific page. Usually what I do is I'll pull up the page that I want to link to, and simply copy the address. If I wanted to link to this page, I would bring that up and copy it. But that link is going to start with HTTP or HTTPS. That href attribute, again, is an example of an attribute. An attribute meaning additional information about the tag. It's only part of the start tag. There's no attributes in the end tag. And all attributes have sort of the same format. The name of the attribute, an equal sign, and then, in quotes, the value of the attribute. And in this case, it's the full address or URL of the page that I want to link to. This is what you do when you're linking to a page that's not one of your pages. Not a page that you've created, but a page elsewhere on the internet. Okay? The other thing that you can do link-wise is link to another page that you've created. For example, I created for this little example, I created two pages, a home page and a web development page. Now both of them are in the same folder. All right. To create a link to another one of your pages, all you, provided it's in the same folder, all you need to do is, is create the link having an href of the name of the file. You don't need HTTPS in front of it. You just need the name of the file. That's provided it's in the same folder. Later on, we'll talk about what if it's in a different folder, because sometimes you can structure your website to have folders if you had a particularly big website. Now, in both cases, the link is going to have something between the start and end tag. And that, link, that is going to be the, the link text, the text that you click on to go to that page. You need that, because otherwise you have a link that people can't access, because there's no text to click on. So links always look like this. You have a starting tag. Parting the, part of the starting tag is going to be an href that has the address of the page. If it's someone else's page, it's going to be the full address. If it's one of your own pages, provided it's in the same folder, it's just going to be the file name. You then have, between the start and the end tag, you have the text that you click on to access that link. All right, this in a nutshell is what we went over last time. So review for you folks and uh, new information possibly or supporting information for what's in the book for the people that are taking this class online um, given that we did not have a recording last time. Questions about this? I've got a question for you. Uh -huh. uh, suppose in the web development you wanted to have some subsections on it that showed like videos, for example. How would you do that? What do you mean? The question was, what if you had subsections under web development? Um, by that I mean um, you wanted more than one, you wanted web development and then maybe you wanted another, uh, under each one of those, like LCC homepage, 
there were subcategories that you wanted to be able to link to as well? That would be, that would be usually that's done kind of like this. I think we saw that on LC's homepage. For example, what you're describing, I think, is like this. Under student resources, there's a list of other categories. Um, we're not quite ready to do that right now. H, because <clears throat> it requires us to have um, CSS or JavaScript to do this. Now, in the case of this, essentially, the HTML code is just to have another unordered list with these links. Okay. But so the, I can do like a sub within the order link. Uh, I can do another order, unordered list. Yeah, we could make we could make another unordered list that would that would have uh, okay. that in it. All right, but there's easier ways to do it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think we were playing around with making mistakes, and I forgot the end greater than sign on the. OK. So there we go. That's correct. All right. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to look at another kind of link. And these are links that are often find, the best example I can think of is in a frequently asked question page. You also see these things like in a phone directory. Um, it's not the only place that you can have them, but those are some very common usages on the web. So let's go and look. I'm going to upload my correction to that file. while I think of it. Okay. We're going to look at frequently asked questions. Here's an example of a frequently asked questions page for open office. Um, I'm not 100% why, sure why I chose this one, but um, Open source software is something that's really interesting. Uh, and I try to make all my students aware of it. Open source software is software that you can legally obtain for free that's developed by a community of, for the most part, volunteers that are working on it. So you have the code that you can make any changes that you want to it. So if you want an extra feature in, uh, you can go and, and add that feature to it. Um, and it might get incorporated into the general release. So it's really cool. Uh, for most major kinds of software, there are open source versions of it. Um, for uh, image processing, you know, the main uh, pay software is Photoshop. There is a free photo editing software application called the GIMP. All right, for audio processing, there's any number of 
things that you can pay for. And then there's Audacity, which is absolutely free. But OpenOffice is sort of the open source version of Microsoft Office. And so their frequently asked, page, uh, frequently asked questions page looks like this. Notice that all the questions are on the same page. But you don't have to scroll to get to them. If you click on the FAQ, the page jumps to the question in the navigation. And then you can click back to the top. Notice that we're not really leaving this one page. The page that we're on is openoffice.org, FAQs, FAQ overview.html. What changes is a little thing at the end. There's a pound sign that indicates sort of the place in the page that we're jumping to. So if I click this, it is taking me to section 9. Notice it jumps to pound sign 9. If I click back to top, I, it shows me pound sign top. So what this is, is this is a different kind of link. We're not jumping to someone else's page. We're not jumping to another one of our pages. We're jumping to a specific spot within the same page that we were already in. All right? And let's look at how we can do that. We can do that by I'm going to extract the FAQ. All right. Here's a web development frequently asked questions page. And the way this works, if we click on this, it jumps to that section of the page. Now, Depending on how much content you have, it's more or less apparent. To really make it apparent, I'm going to make the window small. So if I click what is CSS, it jumps to that at the top. It'll just make sure that whatever we clicked on is visible. Now one thing that you might notice in this page is the words here are kind of unintelligible. They're kind of like Latin-ish. And uh, this is known as Greek text. Greek text is a, what has been used for a long time by printers as just sort of a placeholder text. All right. So for example, if I was making this frequently asked page, but I didn't have the answer to some of these questions, I was still working on it. All right. I might just put Greek text there as a placeholder, just so I could show someone how the page is going to work. All right. And then when I have the actual article, I'll replace the Greek text with the actual article. But you'll see in some of the examples that I do, I use Greek text simply because I don't want to sit up here typing for 20 minutes and making up some text for that uh, and boring everyone to pieces because I'm the world's slowest typist and I make dozens of mistakes and so on. So I just copy that from a, a site. Yes? No, there's a, there's a page that generates it. If you go to Greek text, if you Google Greek text, rather, sometimes it's also called lorem ipsum, because that's typically the first couple of words in, in Greek text. Uh, you can uh, generate some Greek text if you want. Like, I can generate five paragraphs of it if I want. I can generate it, and there it comes up. And then you can just copy that, wrap your paragraph tags around it, and you're in business. Now, Greek text is, is, is OK when you're still working and designing and planning a site is obviously not OK on a final version of the site. So what you turn in to me should not contain any Greek text. All right? Unless it's for the one exception of that is when, you, when we look at the project design. 
All right, when you're still designing your web pages for your final project, it's okay to have Greek text. Okay, let's look at the code here. And it's very similar to the other links with one exception. We still have the A. We still have href equals something. We still have the text that we click on. We still have the end A. The difference is the way this looks. This starts with the pound sign or hashtag character if you prefer. And then it has a name. Name should include no spaces. As, ge as a general rule, don't put spaces in your file names. It's, it's better not to do that. And don't put spaces in your IDs or class names or anything like that. What this corresponds to, the fact that it begins with a pound sign tells the browser, hey, this isn't a brand new page. This is simply, simply a section of the current page. And where does it go to? It goes to whatever tag has an ID that matches the pound sign. So when I click what is HTML, notice this H2 has an ID of HTML answer. And the href is pound sign HTML answer. So it will jump to that section of the page. Pound sign CSS answer, it will jump to the thing on the page that has an ID of CSS answer. Finally, pound sign JS answer, it will jump to the thing on the page that says JS answer. Top of the page is simply pound sign. So all the back to the top links simply have a pound sign there. Pound sign simply means top of the page by itself. So your href will have pound sign something and something on the page will have an ID that matches what you included in the href. Now, that ID will not have the pound sign in it, though. Only the href has the pound sign in it. We're going to use IDs for other things later on in the course. The idea of an ID is it's something, ID stands for identification. All right? And what that means, when something is, is able to be used for identification, it only refers to one thing. All right? In other words, you and your brother don't share a driver's license, right? Your driver's license is for you, all right? Your student ID number and student ID card is just for you, all right? An ID can only relate to one thing in order for it to be an ID. So this isn't going to work very well if I have something else on the page that has an ID of HTML answer. So these IDs should be unique. There should only be one instance of it per page. So I can't have two things with the same ID. Yes? Just purely for notification purposes, are there ever going to be times that use an underscore? So that's just what I'm using, using a placeholder for the space? Ah, uh, you can put an underscore in, yeah, in, in, in an ID or... Uh, well, I, I just meant Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You can use you can use an ID. Uh, you can use an underscore um, in that. Okay. That's about it for these kinds of links. All right. There's another kind of link, and that's an email link. And what will happen is if you make an email link, it will, when you click on the link, it will open up your email program, like if you have Outlook or some other email program. The way that that works is a href equals mail to colon and then the email address of the person. So 
So the difference between all these kinds of links is what the href looks like. href looks different for an external link to link to someone else's web page. It's different for your own web page. It's different for an email link. And it's different uh, for a link within the same page. If I do this then, now I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work because I don't think email's set up on this machine. But if I view this page and there's an email link, if I click this link, it's going to start up, yeah, my email application, whatever it is. So that's the email application. It's not installed completely, so it's probably not going to really work. But if it was, a, yeah, I have to go. This asked me to add an account. If you did have an email program set up on your machine, it would open up the email program and, and sort of pre-address the email to that. That just saves you having to copy and paste the link or the email address in. Yes? Uh, hyper uh, HTTP reference. Or hypertext reference, one of the two. So those are four kinds of links. And again, you know, mix and match. Whatever the situation calls for, you can use any or all of those links. All right, what I want to look at now is um, I want to look at now creating styling for the page. All right? And I'm going to do that by doing a different language. All right? And I'm going to start by putting the style code on this page right as part of the HTML document. Next week when we do this, we're going to separate it out into its own file. And the advantage of that will be that we can use the same file for as many web pages as we want. So I could use the same CSS code for every file, all right, which is a good thing. But for now, I'm going to put it in the head section. Because again, this is, this is information about the page. It is not something that's going to display on the page. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a style tag. That tells the browser that all the code between here and here is, H is not HTML, it's CSS code. So the browser will know that, hey, that code is not HTML, it's CSS code, so therefore interpret it as CSS code. Your CSS file consists of a set of rules. And these rules can range from very simple to very complicated. But all the rules have two parts. They have a selector. And then they have a set of attributes. The selector identifies what on the page does this rule apply to. The simplest kind of rule is where we put the name of an HTML tag. So for example, I can say body. That means that this rule is going to apply to everything in the body tag. Well, guess what? Everything in the body tag is the whole page. So if I say body, that means it's going to apply to everything in on the page. The whole page is going to look like this. I then have these curly braces. I right, then I'm going to have the name of an attribute and a value. Very similar to H, the href is an attribute where I have the name of the attribute and a value. The attributes are predefined so I can't just make up an attribute. And the values typically are predefined as well because 
I can't just say, you know, make the color of this page, well, kind of a pale red, but not as pale as like a real pale red, but paler than a bright red. I can't just like write out a description. I have to use some standard notation to describe, for example, the color of a page. So I can define rules like this. I can say background yellow semicolon color blue. Now if I do that, the background of the page, the background of everything in the body tag, well guess what, that's the entire page. The background of everything in the body tag, so the whole page is going to have a background of yellow. Color relates to the color of the text. So the color of the text is going to be blue. So when I save this page, it's going to have a yellow background and blue font in it. So if I go and view this, the page is yellow with blue font. Now, what font did it use? Well, we didn't specify what font to use. We just specified the color. So the browser uses the default font, which is probably for this browser Times New Roman. How big did it make the font? Well, we didn't specify a size for the font, so it made it the default size. The way your page looks depends on two things. It depends on the browser's defaults, and it depends on the CSS code that you write. For example, if you're really paying close attention, you notice these links are a slightly different color. They're uh, like a magenta, all right? Why? That's the default for a visited link. So we visited these links already today, and therefore, by default, those links are going to appear magenta. So anything on the page, if you're wondering why does it look that way, either it's the browser default or it's some CSS code that you've written. Now, in this case, I've made everything in the body have a background of yellow and a color of blue. I can specify per, a, per tag how I want other things on the page to look. Yes? By default, it just ignores the uh, web links when applying that color? It, it applies the default of the browser to those colors. If we want to specify the color of a link, we have to do that explicitly. So color of blue means the color of the plain text, not the color of the links. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I sort of misspoke when, when I said the text on the page is the text that's not part of a link. Now, if I do this, if I say H1 is a selector, And I can do background blue. Color yellow. OK. Let's see if we can figure out how the page is going to look. How do we think the page is going to look? Yes? Okay. Will the whole page be the inverse? The H1. What about the rest of the page? Exactly. Exactly. CSS stands for cascading style sheets. So these style sheets sort of work in levels. And it's almost like a waterfall dripping down. This rule says everything in the body has a background of yellow and a color of blue. So the browser is going to paint everything in the body with those colors. But 
I then say, well, everything in an H1 is going to have a background of blue and a color of yellow. So it's just going to change those sections of the page that are within the H1 tag. So most of the page is going to be yellow with blue font. The H1s are going to be blue with a yellow font. No. No. It is based on sort of the closer a rule is defined to a thing on the page, the more specific a rule is that takes precedence over the position. So the position doesn't matter. In other words, you're, you're right. I, I kind of worded that mis misleadingly. I made it sound like first it's going to paint the H1s, then it's going to go and paint everything in the body. It, it's really based more on the specificity of it. So H1 is more specific because it covers like more specific area on the screen than the entire body. The further nested it is, the more specific it's considered to be. So that takes precedence over something that is uh, in a parent tag. All right. Now we can do that to literally every tag on the page if we wanted to. I could make my H2s look different. Would there be a way if you wanted to make it a very specific H2 and not all of them? Yes. Uh, let's talk about this first, and then we can talk about uh, the question of what if I wanted one specific H2 to look different for whatever reason. The way I'm writing these selectors now, it applies to every tag on the page of that type. So if I say H2, background is white, color blue, every H2 on the page is going to get that rule. So every H page, every H2 on the page gets that rule. All right. Now we'll talk about how to be more specific later on, but in a nutshell, you can define a style rule. The three sim the simplest ways to define a style rule, first of all, is with an HTML tag. Secondly, with a class where we can define a class and make all of them of the same class look a certain way. And lastly, we can define a style rule for an ID, where we can make just one thing on a page look different. As a general rule, though, it's a good design principle to make similar things look the same. For example, what is HTML? What is CSS? What is JavaScript? Those are all H2s, but more importantly, on our page, those are all the titles of our frequently asked questions. Those are the frequently asked questions. So it's good to make those look the same, right? Because that gives the user a visual cue that these are the same sorts of things, right? Users tend to think if it looks the same, it is the same, right? Every stop sign is shaped the same way, right? Could you imagine a confusion if stop signs were different sizes and colors depending on what intersection you came to? You know, you can be far down the street and uh, you might not even be able to read the word stop on it, but if you see a red thing and it, well, that sort of looks like an octagon, you know it's a stop sign, all right? You've learned that because the designers of our streets have made consistency. Just like within a town, the way all the street signs look, on the highway, the way all the uh, highway signs look, they all have a consistent look. That way you don't have to figure out each sign individually. You look at that, oh, that's a sign that says what the next exit's going to be. You can tell that at a glance without thinking about it. There's a similar thing in web design, too. Whereas we can go in and we're going to make things that serve a similar purpose look the same. That's very reassuring to the user. We could make everything on the page look totally different colors, but then 
the user doesn't know what's going on and can't easily figure out what's up. All right. So one of our goals in design is to achieve a level of consistency where we make our pages and the elements of the pages have a consistent look and feel. So as our user gets to use our site, they get used to it. And they start to understand the way the site is structured sort of just intuitively. All right. I'm going to make the color to these black. So there, the text is white, the color is black. What if I omit the background color on the H2? That's a reasonable answer. Does anyone else have a thought? It'll be yellow. Why? Because the H2 is still part of the body. So we've made, we said everything on the body has a background of yellow and a color of blue. Well, we said H2s have a color, which means text color of black. That blue or that yellow background from the body sort of bleeds through, right? Sort of cascades down. And therefore, if we look at this, sure enough, it's going to be yellow with a text of black. Cascading style sheets are one of those things where the idea is sort of simple. But the way that you can combine them by choosing the proper selectors and, and all gets to be very complicated. You can either do it in a brute force way, or you can do it in, in sort of a smart, clever way. That's one of the reasons why I don't use something like Dreamweaver in this class. Uh, Dreamweaver does things in a very brute force way. And if you're not careful, um, you'll have a whole mess of code where something simple would suffice. All right? Now, to be sure, cascading style sheets, the principle's easy, but there are so many ways that you can select elements. There are so many ways that the rules cascade, and there's so many of these attributes that I can put in that it becomes pretty complicated. All right. We're just talking about colors because colors are, the, are the, like the two easiest things to show, the color of the text and, and the color of the background. I hope no one's colorblind, by the way, in this class and can tell the difference between that. All right. But literally anything about the appearance of the page, we can change via CSS. So the way this class is going to progress is I'm going to do a little bit of CSS and a little bit of HTML. We'll look at some new HTML tags, and we'll look at some new properties in CSS that we can use to change them. All right? Uh, because, again, you're not going to memorize all of the HTML tags or all of the CSS attributes. You'll remember what you commonly use. And everything else, I hope you remember enough to know how to look it up and find the correct answer. All right. Uh, we're going to head up the lab now. Um, see you up there. So no class on Monday. No class on Monday, correct. Uh, first assignment is due, right? That's correct.